Hello everyone, my name is Patrick, I'm one half of Historia Canadiana, a podcast where two grad students discuss and debate parts of Canadian history as it's expressed through cultural items like literature. The show comes out every two weeks and goes out of its way to bring you a dynamic and fresh take on a country that way too many people find boring. Listen to two nerds chat about Canada's history on Historia Canadiana, everywhere you get your podcasts. I'll see you there. Hello everyone, and welcome to the History of Russia. As usual, I'm Damon, and this is episode 8, A Step Too Far, or Sviatoslav Part 2. Thanks for listening in. So last time out, we covered the first half of the reign of Sviatoslav, or Sviatoslav I, to give him his actual title, although he wasn't called that at the time. And we took a look at his early rebel-rousing years, the taking of the reins of power in Kiev somewhere at the beginning of the 960s, his tolerant paganism, strangely piratical appearance, and the brilliant and successful military campaign against the Khazars, which led me to the conclusion that our eponymous hero was a highly effective military strategist, rather than being an angry young hothead or mafia boss. So in this episode, the action continues at the same furious pace and we'll see more Byzantine incentivization, another Rus military campaign, this time against the Danubian Bulgars, and then more Byzantine double dealing, and then a Pechenik raid on Kiev and Olga's swan song. And then we'll look at the end of Sviatoslav's reign, review his performance and take a quick look at his legacy and reputation. And then finally, and just for some context, we'll take a very brief glimpse of what's going on around the world in the year 972. But before I start, as always, if you want to get in touch, then you can in a number of different ways. Via the website, which is historyofrussia.podbean.com or on Twitter at historyrussia1, that's history Russia, or one word with the number one after it. Or you can follow me or subscribe on whichever platform you listen in on. And a massive thanks to M, Catherine, Magellan04 and T-Town Warrior for doing just that. Thanks guys, I really appreciate it. And of course, if you're feeling generous, it would be great if you could leave me a five-star rating or review on Apple Podcasts. And the reason I ask for this is it really helps to make the podcast more visible and will hopefully allow me to reach a wider audience. Okay, off we go. So, I'm going to ask you all to try and envisage the following imaginary scene, which I've made up, but is relevant. So it's the year 967. We're in Kiev, and Sviatoslav and his chiefs are gathered around a table and looking over a couple of documents. Well, probably in reality, bits of rough parchment or pieces of bark. Item number one is a rudimentary map which shows that after the Kazo campaign, Kievan Rus has more than doubled in size and now extends eastwards all the way to the Volga and southwards all the way to the foothills of the Caucasus Mountains. But item number two is much more interesting. It's a kind of rough inventory or ledger which itemises the latest trading accounts And it shows a very handy increase in the exports of high quality furs, amber, wax and slaves. And more importantly, on the flip side, a healthy improvement in the amount of imported goods and a nice big wadge of cash in the shape of Arab silver dirhams. But here's the really good bit. None of this vulgar based largesse has been subject to the normal 10% Khazar tribute or tax. So happy days. The sun shining, the drinks flowing, indulge me here, and all is good in the world of the Rus. But then all of a sudden, the sun disappears behind a cloud, and a chill wind starts to blow. Some horsemen are spotted on the horizon to the south, and they very slowly make their way towards the city. The Rus stir, alarms are sounded, weapons are grabbed, horses mounted, and a small hastily assembled war party rides out to intercept the raiders, only to discover that this is no band of Pechenig pillagers, 
which is easy for me to say, but rather a group of envoys from the Byzantine Emperor Nicephorus II Phocas. And they've got a very interesting proposal to put to Sviatoslav. You see, Nicephorus is planning to invade Danubian Bulgaria. Essentially, that's the Bulgaria of today, uh, from the south. And he thinks that things would go a lot better if the Rus simultaneously attacked the Bulgars from the north. And then the spoils and the territory can be shared between the two of them. Sviatoslav and his men are intrigued, but they're also reluctant to get involved. Life's good at the moment. There's no real need to waste further resources and overextend their reach on what could be a risky enterprise. But the Byzantines seem to know their man, because at this point, the envoys casually mention that no pressure here, but if the Rus were to join them in this enterprise, then £15,000 of gold would be theirs. Sviatoslav signs up straight away, of course he does, and rushes off to make logistical preparations and draw up plans with his chiefs. And so whilst he's doing that, we'll take a pause and we'll look at what's behind all of this and why the Byzantines are making such a lucrative offer to someone who's just proved himself as a highly effective military leader. I mean, I'm smelling a rat here, or at least something just a bit fishy. But putting aside rats and fish for the moment, let's go back in time a bit and check out recent relations between these Bulgars in the Danube region and the Byzantine, Byzantine Empire. So during the reign of the Bulgarian Emperor, Peter I, and he was in charge between 927 and 969, the Magyars, who remember a couple of episodes back were blitzkrieging most of Europe, had turned their attention towards the Balkans. Now they'd done this a few years before, but had been temporarily contained by Peter's father Simeon I. But the raids had started up again, and Peter I's efforts to cope with them were proving futile, with the result that on several occasions the Magyars had reached Byzantine Thrace and pillaged it. Now, the empire had vehemently protested and accused the Bulgarians of not only doing very little to stop these incursions, but of actively encouraging the Magyars and threatened punitive action if they didn't stop. This puts Peter in a bit of a bind. What was he to do? Well, the Magyars are actually in Bulgarian territory and the Byzantines, well, they are protesting, however vehemently, from Constantinople, which is hundreds of miles away. So... Hmm, let's have a think about this. And so in 965, Peter I reaches an agreement with the Magyars, of course he does, and provides them with free passage through Bulgaria to continue their raids on the Byzantines. Now once he'd gotten wind of this agreement, Nicephorus's first move in the spring of 966 is to stop paying the yearly cash insurance fee to the Bulgars, who were meant to be acting as a buffer state in the Balkans, and obviously weren't. And then secondly, he starts massing troops on the border with Bulgaria in a show of military strength. But at this stage, this is as far as Nicephorus is prepared to go. Bulgaria features difficult mountainous terrain, and he knows that things could get messy with the empire becoming potentially bogged down if he was to invade. So he hopes that troops on the border will cause Peter to think again, break his agreement with the Magyars, but this doesn't happen. And in fact, Peter reminds the Byzantines that no help came from them when his father had asked for it during the first Magyar incursions into his land. And you've got to admit that's a fair point. And so we've reached a bit of an impasse, and Nicophorus, I keep saying Nicophorus, I think it's Nicophorus. Uh, Nicophorus just seems a bit more comfortable for me to say. He's in a bind of his own, which involves more than just this spat with Peter. Because, you see, whilst he's generally considered to be one of this generation's finest generals, as proven in a recent successful campaign against the Arabs, he had got to the top of the pile and become the de facto emperor via a military coup, helped by the fact that the sons of the previous emperor, and therefore the legitimate heirs, were only five and three, respectively. Now this was only four years ago, in 963, 
But as a supposed military strongman, he needs to do more than just talk the talk with the Bulgars. He knows he's got to show some decisive leadership backed up with significant action. Otherwise, his position could be at risk. I mean, if a strongman won't be strong, what's the point in having a strongman? So what to do? What to do? Ah, yes. What about that group of people we encouraged to take out the Khazars a couple of years ago? What are they up to these days? Surely they can help us out here. And at the same time, we can keep them busy and, well, of course, you know the rest. So we're told that either in August 967 or in the early spring of 968, August 967 being the most probable, and so that's what I've gone with, the Rus under Sviatoslav crossed the Danube into Bulgarian territory, and there they defeated a Bulgarian army of 30,000 men, which is almost certainly a massive overestimate at the Battle of Silistra. And according to the Bulgarian historians, Sviatoslav seized 80 towns in northeastern Bulgaria, which were looted and destroyed, but not permanently occupied. Which, if you remember from last week's episode on the Khazar campaign, is the preferred Rus modus operandi. Slaughter first, money and trade second, territory third. Now apparently Tsar Peter suffered an epileptic fit or stroke when he received the news of the defeat, but he partially recovered soon after, and he ordered his remaining forces to retreat to the fortress of Dorostolon on the other side of the Danube. And with the campaigning season coming to an end, the Rus wintered at a place called Peraya Slavets in the Danube Delta, and no doubt inventoried their goods, counted their money, and prepared their plans for the next spring. But at this point, the primary chronicle reports that some, at some time in 968, Sviatoslav left Pereya Slavets with part of his army and headed back to Kiev, which doesn't sound like a pragmatic or positive move. So why is he doing this? What's gone wrong? Well, we're told that Nikephorus, who hadn't actually invaded Bulgaria from the south, had been appraising things, and from his point of view, Whilst the Rus have kept their side of the bargain and been a major thorn in Peter's side in northern Bulgaria, perhaps, as with the Khazar campaign, they've become too successful and maybe Sviatoslav could become a bigger problem than either of the Magyars or Bulgars. So Nikephorus calls in his advisers and they come up with an idea to keep the Rus off balance, which involves getting those perennial steppe troublemakers, the Pechenegs, of whom the majority are no fans of the Rus, to raid Kiev. Or, if you want, there's an alternative version. It's not Nikephorus who stirs up the Pechenegs, but Peter, who is desperate to get the Rus out of his lands. Anyway, whoever did the inciting, Sviatoslav, who is still on his way back to Kiev, has got a situation to sort out. But what he doesn't know at this stage is the extent of that situation, because the Pechenegs have already attacked Kiev, and whilst their initial thrust has been fought off by the Rus militia, who are being directed by none other than the indomitable Olga, they managed to remain in situ and have now laid siege to the city. And according to the Chronicle, the besieged were suffering greatly from hunger and thirst, and Olga, who was inside Kiev together with all three of Sviatoslav's sons, was seriously contemplating surrender. However, there was a shred of hope as one of the Rus generals, whose name was Pretik or Pretich, was now in the vicinity of Kiev, as he'd been sent ahead of the main army by Sviatoslav. Now somehow, Olga manages to get word out of the city, and early the next morning, Pretik and his troops embark on boats across the Dnieper, making a great noise. The besieged Kievans start cheering, and Olga ventured out of the gates towards the river, and the Pechenegs, thinking that Sviatoslav was returning with his great army, lifted the siege. So then the Pecheneg leader decided to confer with Pretich and ask him whether he was really Sviatoslav, and Pretich had to admit that he was only a general, but warned the Pechenegs that his unit was a vanguard of Sviatoslav's approaching army, and so the Pechenegs weighed things up, and decided that as they'd fulfilled their side of the Byzantine or Bulgarian bargain, a tactical retreat was the best bet. 
but they weren't quick enough. Because the next day, the main army under Sviatoslav arrived on the scene, cut off the Pesheneg retreat, and destroyed the bulk of their forces, leaving only a handful of survivors who somehow managed to slip away. And again, according to the Chronicle, not long after the siege, Olga became very ill, a situation that could have been triggered by the fact that Sviatoslav had made plans to leave her beloved Kiev to return to Perea Slavets and indeed make it his capital, which on the face of it is a strange decision as it's further away from the established trading routes on the Dnieper and the Volga. The ailing Olga, knowing that she was close to death, convinced him to stay with her during her final days, but a short time later, probably in early 969, she passed away. Okay, so whilst all of this excitement had been going on in Kiev, what were the Byzantines and the Bulgarians up to? Well, we're told that Tsar Peter, who was worn out and ill, had sent envoys to Constantinople to negotiate a new agreement, and that Nikephorus on the surface had received them with great honour. Nevertheless, being very conv- confident of his position, and not forgetting that he needed to be seen as the strong man, he demanded harsh terms. Peter was to resign and be replaced by his son Boris, who was much more malleable than his father and the two young children of the previous emperor, Basil and Constantine, were to be married to Bulgarian princesses. By this stage, Peter was a broken man. He accepted Nikephorus's terms, and he retired to a monastery, where he died in 969, leaving his son to become Tsar Boris II. OK, back to Kiev. In the summer of that year, Sviatoslav left the city, dividing the Rus territories into three parts, each under the nominal rule of one of his sons, and at the head of an army that included Pechenegh and Magyar mercenaries. And just a point on this, I mean, we've heard that the Pechenegs were encouraged to raise the siege of, uh, or see, put Kiev under siege. But obviously some of the Pechenegs were mercenaries, as I've just said, and, and they would fight for anyone. So there, there were no loyalties lost with these Pechenegs that were fighting with Sviatoslav. And Sviatoslav's army invaded Bulgaria again, but at this time his blood was really up and he was out to get even for the siege of Kiev. And so he kept going south. He devastated Bulgarian Thrace, capturing the city of Filiopolis and massacring its inhabitants. And Nikephorus now realised that he had a massive problem on his hands and fearing that the Rus would head further south, which they soon did, responded by repairing the defences of Constantinople and raising new squadrons of troops. But right in the middle of these preparations, Nikephorus was overthrown and killed by his nephew, John Simiskis, who set himself up as the new emperor. And just a bit of background here. After helping Nikephorus to the throne and continuing to defend the empire's eastern provinces, Simiskis was deprived of his command during a court intrigue, for which he retaliated by conspiring with Nikephorus' wife Theophano and a number of disgruntled leading generals to assassinate Nikephorus. And again, just out of interest, Simiskis either means red boots, which is my favourite, or short of stature, which he was, or it could simply refer to the place where he was born, which sadly is the most probable. So John at first attempted to persuade Sviatoslav to leave Bulgaria, but he's unsuccessful. The Rus ruler wasn't going anywhere. And, if anything, he continued on the offensive. He laid siege to the Byzantine city of Adrianople in 970, a move which we're told caused real panic in the streets of Constantinople. But later that year, the Byzantines launched a counter-offensive. But being occupied with suppressing a revolt brought on by Nikephorus' family in Asia Minor, John sent his commander-in-chief, Bardas Skleros, who went on to defeat Sviatoslav's coalition of Rus, Pechenegs, Magyars and Bulgarians at the Battle of Arcadiopolis. And then John, having quashed the revolt in Asia Minor, came up to the Balkans with a large army and styling himself as the liberator of Bulgaria, 
captured Mar Marcianopolis, where the Rus were holding a number of Bulgar princes hostage. Sviatoslav is now realising that the Byzantine forces under Bardas and John were a completely different proposition to those of Nikephorus, and he retreats to Durostolon, which the Byzantine armies then besieged for 65 days. And, to cut a long and bloody story short, cut off and surrounded, the Rus came to terms with John. They agreed to abandon the Balkans, renounce their claims to all other Byzantine territory, and return to the west of the Dnieper River. In return, John supplied the Rus with food and safe passage home, and so a weary Sviatoslav and his men set sail and landed on Berezan Island at the mouth of the Dnieper, where they made their camp for the winter. But several months later, according to the Primary Chronicle, their camp was devastated by famine, leaving just a fragment of the Rus army to try and make it up the Dnieper and back to safety in Kiev. Now by this point, John was having second thoughts. Fearing that the peace with Sviatoslav would not last if he made it back to Kiev, which it probably wouldn't have, he induced the Peshenig Khan, Kurya, to get rid of Sviatoslav before he reached the city. And according to Slavic sources, one of Sviatoslav's men, a certain Sveneld, tried to warn Sviatoslav to avoid the Dnieper Rapids. But by this time the bedraggled Rus were desperate. The advice was ignored with the result that Sviatoslav was ambushed and killed by the Pechenegs when he tried to cross the cataracts near Kort Itzia early in 972 and the primary chronicle reports that his skull was made into a chalice or a drinking cup by the Pechenegs Khan. So in just three short years Sviatoslav has gone from being the feared conqueror of the Khazars and Bulgars to becoming a headless corpse in a ditch at the age of 29, a victim of his own greed and hubris, Byzantine military prowess and skullduggery, and Pechenegg treachery. And his death left a political vacuum which led to tensions growing among his three sons, something that we'll take a look at in more detail in the next episode. So in the end, how do you measure Sviatoslav's reign over the Rus? Was it a success or a failure? Well, I'm going to sit firmly on the fence here and say that it was a bit of both. I mean, if you look at the positives, he destroyed the Khazars, doubled the Rus' territory, saved Kiev from the Pechenegs, even though they were retreating, allowed Kievans to convert to Christianity, and had three sons to further the dynasty. But then on the flip side... His reign is too short, nine years and, and one-dimensional to be considered great or even good. It's all greed, fighting and pillaging. There are no administrative reforms or notable cultural advances. And his aggressive policy got him so far, but when he came up against the Byzantine generals John and Bardas, he'd beaten off more than he could chew. And you have to wonder if his biggest mistake was taking Nikephorus' off, offer in the first place. I think that the real turning point, though, was during the second invasion of Bulgaria, when he pressed on into Byzantine territory. The smarter move would have been to stop, consolidate his gains and start up new trading routes and negotiate with the empire from a position of strength. But he didn't. And you have to say, he seemed to have got what he deserved. Reputationally, though, it's a different story. Sviatoslav has often been said, long been seen as a hero or a nationalistic figurehead by Belarusian, Russian and Ukrainian leaders and patriots. And this is entirely due to his military success. And he's been characterised in paintings, books, plays and films, most of the time as the hero, but again, sometimes as the villain. So he hasn't got away with things scot-free, even in his reputation. Okay, I'm going to finish with a couple of footnotes that I found interesting. So in 2005, there were reports that a village in the Belgorod region in Russia, which is close to the Ukrainian border, had erected a monument in Sviatoslav's victory over the Khazars by the Russian sculptor Vyacheslav Klikov. The reports described the 13-metre-tall statue as depicting a Rus cavalryman standing over a defeated Khazar who was bearing a Star of David and a Kolovrat which, for those who don't know, and I didn't, 
that a colivrat was an early version of the swastika. Now this obviously created an outcry within the Russian Jewish community and the controversy was further exacerbated by Klukov's connections with a group called Pamyat and other anti-Semitic organisations, as, well as, as well as by his involvement in the Letter of 500, a controversial appeal to the Prosecutor General to review all Jewish organisations in Russia for extremism. So the press centre of the Belgorod Regional Administration responded by stating that a planned monument to Sviatoslav had not yet been constructed, but would show respect towards representatives of all nationalities and religions. And when the statue was unveiled, the warrior's shield bore a 12-pointed star, supposedly representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And I had to wonder when I read this as to whether they were halfway through the original monument, then all the fuss started and they changed their plans. Who knows? And then on the 7th of November 2011, a Ukrainian fisherman found a metre-long sword in the river Dnieper at Kort Utsia, near where Sviatoslav is believed to have been killed in 972. And the interesting thing about this sword was, it was made out of four different metals, or the handle was anyway, including gold and silver, and could possibly have belonged to Sviatoslav himself. But then again, it could have, been, it could have belonged to just about any nobleman from that period and there's no proof either way. But it is nice to think that it could have been Sviatoslav's. OK, let's take that brief glimpse at what's going on elsewhere. So the Emperor Otto II married a Princess Theophano. She was the niece of the Byzantine Emperor John Simiskis, not the Theophano that he uh, had a court intrigue with, but uh, a different one. And this led to a significant impact on German intellectual life, including interest in Greek literature and Byzantine art. The House of Wessex still holds sway in England, and in 972, Edgar the Peaceful is the man in charge. But in six years' time, it will be his son, Ethelred, yes, that Ethelred, who will become king. The Fujiwara Regency is in charge of Heian period Japan, and over in China, it's the Song Dynasty who will be around for the next 300 years. OK, we're going to leave it there. Join me next time round when we'll look at the situation that came about in the lands of the Kievan Rus after Sviatoslav's premature demise. But until then, stay safe, look after yourself, and I'll see you all soon.